So let me introduce you to Dr. Aaron Drummond. Dr. Aaron Drummond is a cognit cognitive cyber psychologist with a keen interest in psychological antecedents and consequences of digital media and te technology use. Aaron's research is concerned with issues such as the psychological effects of digital media, use on aggression, mental health, academic performance, and recognition. Most recently, Aaron has published in the leading journals, Nature, Human Behavior, and Addiction on the issue of loot boxes and gambling-related mechanisms in video games. He has contributed oral and written testimony to governments on the subject of loot boxes in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, and the US. He is currently completing work on Marsden Fast Start Grant, investigating the consequences of engaging with loot boxes, with loot box mechanisms in video games. Um, I have I have personally uh, um, been present when. Um, Dr. Aaron has presented on loot boxes, and his his work is absolutely fascinating. So I'm really, really, really happy and privileged to uh, welcome Dr. Aaron today and this morning and um, to IGC. And um, if you'd like to join me in welcoming welcoming him, please. Kiora, it's fantastic to be here today. Um, I can't tell if I'm coming through. I hope I am. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yes, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me this morning. Um, thank you very much to AUT and to the PGF and to Maria um, and Andre for such an inclusive event, which allows me to be here as well. Um, and, and people with health conditions like myself can still present. Um, so I have to thank everyone for that. And thank you also for your hard mahi. Um, it's, it's a very big privilege for me to present on the third day here. I've been spending the last two days online looking at all the, the various presentations and there's been some fantastic presentations over the last two days. So I want to acknowledge all the presenters who have given their time and effort uh, to their work. And uh, I also want to spend a bit of time just briefly acknowledging my colleagues um, here. Uh, the work that I'm going to present today, they've contributed to greatly and it would not be possible without them. So um, each of those amazing colleagues that you see on the screen there have contributed to something that you'll see today. Um, and I also need to acknowledge the Marsden Fund as well, who have uh, supported our work quite generously over the last three years as we've been working to understand loot boxes. So what I want to do, um, first of all, before we start talking about loot boxes, is I want to engage, if you will um, indulge me, in a very, very brief uh, thought experiment, if I might. So what I would like to do is I'd like you all to imagine that you want to buy a brand new suit. And perhaps you know, you've been um, away from conferences for a couple of years and you want to go to a new conference and you want to look your best and you decide, hey, I want to buy a brand new black suit. So you take yourself off down to the local store and you go down to the local store and you say to the cashier, excuse me, sir, I'd like to buy a, uh, a black suit. And the cashier says, well, actually, sir, I can't sell you a black suit. What I can do is sell you this box. And in this box, there might be a black suit, or there might be a gray suit, or uh, there might be a range of other sort of clothing related items that might be of various utility to you. They may or may not be a black suit, they may or may not be useful to you, or they may not even be a clothing related item. And the only way you're going to know for sure is if you pay me money to take this box off my hand and own it, and in that box, there may or may not be the black suit that you are looking for. And when you open the box, unfortunately, there's a dead parrot inside. Now, this may seem like an absolutely absurd situation, and it is. And yet, this is the situation that video gamers are finding themselves in on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, this brings us to the issue of loot boxes. So, what is a loot box? A loot box is a digital container of rewards. It has a few key features. The first is, it contains random items. Uh, so you don't know what you're going to get in the loot box. It is going to be randomized and delivered to you. 
They're often purchasable for real world money. Not always, but very often they are purchasable for real world money, often for um, sort of one to two dollars um, per purchase. Critically, the contents of a loot box are unknown when you go to purchase them, so you don't know what you're going to get out of them. And they contain items of what we call varying rarity, um, and they are sort of denominated as such to players. So um, you'll find that they are usually called common, uncommon, rare, epic, legendary items that are coming out of these loot boxes. And critically, they may contain functional and or cosmetic items. Now, what I mean by this is that they might contain something that doesn't do anything to the game that you're playing, except change your appearance or change the appearance of one of your weapons, for example, or they may contain functional items. Um, so, for example, uh, they may contain a powerful weapon or power-up that makes you better at future games. Now, this is what a loot box opening looks like. I'll give you a second to just digest this. What you're seeing here is that a loot box appears on the screen. Items burst out of it. Um, I don't have the sound on this particular slide, but there are, is usually accompanied by a lot of bells and whistles going on on the screen. And items of different colours will pop out. On the right-hand side, I want you to pay particular attention to this item here, which is yielding a, a little coin um, as it sort of pops up. I'll come back and talk a little bit about that particular item in a while. Um, but the other thing I want to note here that's really important is this is actually what we would consider to be a losing loot box. So despite all the incredible kind of visual quality and graphics and bells and whistles that are going along with this, this is actually yielding the lowest possible tier of rewards to the player who has just opened it. That's critical and we'll come back to that in just a moment. So the question is where do loot boxes fit within the video game market? So let's start there. Video games are a huge marketplace now, as you probably know. And one of the things that we, we often find is that if I ask people, you know, are you a gamer? Um, we end up with a large number of people um, who don't say yes to that. So we, we only get maybe sort of 30 to 50% of people say that they're a gamer. But when you ask people, do you play any games, including, you know, games on your mobile phone, for example, um, that, that rate of, of gaming goes up. And in fact, there's about 2.6 to 3.2 billion gamers worldwide, depending on which estimates you're using. And in amongst them are about 424 million miners. Very common. I'm sure all of you are aware of this. Um, the games industry itself is worth about $100 billion annually. And so this is a very large industry. But what's critical here is that the loot box industry generated about $15 billion by itself in 2020 alone. And it's estimated that this will go up to about $25 billion by 2024. Loot boxes themselves appear in quite a large number of games. Um, this is a bit different to when uh, I started talking about this uh, in 2018, when they were, they were becoming more common, but they weren't in a lot of games. Um, now we know that they're in about 58%, so about 60% of, of phone games, and about 40% of PC games. So they're very, very prevalent. Now, there's some critical things about loot boxes that are really concerning. And the first is, as we know from traditional gambling, as we're all aware, um, gambling works on that variable ratio reinforcement schedule. And this is also true for loot boxes. The items delivered from loot boxes are going to be coming out on a variable ratio reinforcement schedule. Now, um, as you are aware, this creates the next big win effect, where basically people when they are receiving a reward and it's on a randomised schedule, they're not sure if it's going to be the next time they engage in the behaviour or after another 10 times or 20 times, it creates this feeling that every time you engage in the behaviour, even if you don't get what you're looking for, uh, you are going to feel like you're a little bit closer to the next big win. This is what happens with slot machines, as we all know. Um, and this is also what is uh, underpinning the mechanics of loot boxes. As we all know, this produces very rapid learning um, of behaviours where people will repeat the behaviours very, very often, and it is incredibly resistant to extinction. It's hard to get rid of behaviours that are learned in this way. One other point that I would raise about loot boxes that's a structural issue is they often contain limited run items. They'll often have 
items that are only available in these loop boxes for short periods of time around critical periods in the calendar. So they'll have things like Halloween items, they'll have things like uh, Christmas items that are only available for a three to four week period um, over the course um, of, of the year. And if you don't get the items out of the loot boxes in that time, uh, often you won't be able to get them at all, or you won't be able to get them until the next year uh, later. And so this creates kind of a chasing uh, system where people will be chasing rewards during that particular limited run season. So by now, this might sound an awful lot like gambling to you. Um, and it should. Um, this is another loot box from 2018. I'm just going to let you digest this. Um, it's a little bit horrifying, um, but it is exactly as it appears to, to you to be. Um, it, it mimics a slot machine in all the traditional ways. You can see the wheels going past. You can see the near misses of rewards. Um, you can see the rewards popping up as they go. And players are asked to spin this roulette wheel every time they open a loot box in this particular game. It mimics everything visually, it mimics everything structurally um, in traditional forms of gambling. However, not everything that looks like gambling necessarily is. And so we've got to think a little bit more deeply about loot boxes as to whether or not they're gambling or other forms of risk-taking behaviour. And this is what we did in 2018, and I approached this with a, a great deal of scepticism initially. Um, often I, I find, I think, that many of the media effects that we, uh, we talk about tend to get overblown. Um, so I was quite sceptical about this um, until I started digging into it. Now, there are five things that, that we all know sort of distinguish gambling from other risk-taking behaviours, but just to run through them very briefly, um, the exchange of money or valuable goods has to take place. We have to have an unknown future event which determines the exchange. Chance has to at least partly determine the outcome. Uh, Non-participation uh, can avoid incurring losses, so it has to be a voluntary activity. And this tricky, sticky criteria at the bottom of, of winners gaining something at the sole expense of losers. Um, now, we originally approached this quite conservatively and said, well, maybe this is only the case when a player can get a competitive advantage against other uh, players in future games. So if you remember back to when I said that you might get functional items like a powerful new reward, we thought, okay, well, that's a pretty clear indication that someone's getting something that someone else is not able to use. It's not the only way of conceptualising winning, and we'll come back to that in a little while. Now, this is the original cut that we did of 22 games uh, in loop, uh, that contained loot boxes in 2016 and 2017. This was at the time every mainstream game that had been published which contained loot boxes that we could find um, over the, that period of 2016, 2017. Now, I don't expect you to read this entire slide. Um, the critical thing is across the top, we have kind of those five criteria and then we have our games list on the left here. And the critical thing I want you to take away from this is when we, when we ran this kind of analysis and looked at these features, we found that about 45 to 50% of games contained um, loot boxes which met all five of those critical psychological criteria which distinguish gambling from other forms of risk taking. Okay, so at that point, um, we were fairly convinced that there are structural similarities and psychological similarities between loot boxes and gambling. But of course, policymakers were incredibly interested in this. At the time um, that we wrote that paper, it came out around the time Star Wars Battlefront 2 came out and the governor of Hawaii, for example, uh, quite famously came out and said that um, Star Wars Battlefront 2, the game that had been released, um, was nothing more than a Star Wars themed casino. And so this became a big conversation uh, in, among policymakers about what to do and whether these things should be regulated or banned in some way. There was a lot of pushback um, about this from games industry saying that loot boxes were not a form of gambling. And so in 2020, uh, my colleagues and I undertook an analysis of the legal similarities that might be um, seen from loot boxes to other forms of gambling. And I wanna just quickly talk about that. As we all know, most jurisdictions require three things for gambling to occur. This is not universal, but it is the case across many jurisdictions. And these are, one, you need to have an entry cost or a consideration. Two, you have to have chance involved. And three, you have to have some form of prize. Now with loot boxes, we've got a situation where consideration is 
definitely satisfied wherever loot boxes are purchasable for real world money. And as I say, they are often purchasable for small sums of money. Here's an image of loot boxes in Overwatch, uh, a very popular video game. And what we're seeing here is that you can purchase them for sort of about $2 US. Now, to drive this point home, I want to highlight Diablo Immortal. Um, this is a new game that's just come out. It came out last month. Um, it offers in-app purchases, but it is actually free. So you can download this on your phone for free, or you can download it on your computer for free. However, it does contain loot boxes, or a form of loot boxes called RIPs. And out of those, there are going to be items that are of various um, value. This is a gamer from Whanganui who has just spent $25,000, a little bit more than $25,000 New Zealand, in order to um, acquire his first five out of five star gem. Now, that's troubling, but it's even more troubling when you know that you actually need five of these five out of five star gems in order to completely outfit your character. So we are talking an awful lot of money that could potentially be spent in order to get what this player is hoping to achieve, that is a fully leveled up character. And in the first two weeks that Diablo Immortal, Immortal was out in aggregate, it made $24 million. So this is a, a good indication that we are talking about uh, big money. And I think we can say at this point, considerations pretty much satisfied. Now, with regard to chance, um, this is a core feature of loot boxes. This is another loot box that was uh, in a game in 2020, um, which is actually a basketball game, not that you would necessarily know that just from looking at this screenshot. And so what you're seeing here is exactly the same thing, slot machine going. Um, there was also a, a roulette wheel that would, would turn um, in another part of this game and another kind of uh, Plinko gambling game um, that, that turned up in there as well. Okay, so we have those first two of consideration and chance. What about prize? Now, this was a, a big issue that was pushed back on by the, um, the, the games companies. And the argument was that everyone gets something out of loot boxes so nobody uh, loses and that, you know, these items aren't worth real world money. Well, it turns out both of those things are kind of demonstrably testable and demonstrably can be shown to be false. The first thing to note is that you can buy and sell items in some video games. Um, so this is a screenshot from a game player on Battlegrounds. And what you're seeing here is the marketplace where players are able to list items for quite a lot of money. In this case, a little more than a thousand US dollars for, for one item, for example. Um, and players will buy and sell these items. Now, we, we looked at these marketplaces as well in our, our 2020 paper. And we found that there was about $1 billion worth of sales just across three games that we looked at. Um, so there is a, a large amount of money being spent and that money indicates that people are valuing these things as um, valuable items. The other thing to note here is that we have uh, what we call gray market economies emerging. So not all games have these legitimate marketplaces on which you can trade. Uh, some in fact do not. Um, however, where possible, gamers have found ways to trade these items using the in-game systems and then use PayPal and other features uh, on websites in order to pay one another to get those items. And this will happen even in the absence of a legitimate marketplace. Um, in our, our 2020, uh, 2018 analysis, we found that about 23% of games that we looked at had some form of ability to cash out your, your prizes uh, by on-selling your items. And this implies that these items have value in the absence of markets. You don't need a market. You just need people to have those items and want to sell them and other people to want to buy them for them to be valuable. And so, again, I think this suggests that these things do constitute a prize. Now, another argument that's been put forward, and um, this is a particularly interesting argument, is that actually this is just a different way to pay for video games. It's just a different monetization strategy. And this is something that I, I think is particularly interesting because I know that we have been talking about this over the last couple of days with free-to-play games. There's been some great presentations um, from the Spanish team about free-to-play games in uh, mobile um, during the pandemic. And I think the important thing here is that... Um, people have been sort of suggesting that maybe this is just a different way to pay for your games. But we had a look at that possibility. And here what you see 
is the relationship between people spending on uh, video games along the bottom and people's monthly spending on virtual items of various sorts along the, this axis. Now, if this was just a different way to pay for your video games, what you would see is a displacement effect and a downward line uh, where people, the more people were spending on virtual items, the less they'd be spending on video games uh, and vice versa. But in fact, that's not what you see. What you see instead is this complementary spending where people are spending more on virtual items when they're spending more on video games. And so we are not seeing the, that this is just a different way to monetize games. In fact, it's a complementary uh, revenue source. That last point about can players lose something, um, you know, if, if players can't lose, if no one can lose, then it's not really gambling. Um, there are a couple of ways to think about that. The first is um, you can think about the variable rarity items. Certainly gamers report chasing rare items um, and epic and legendary items quite a lot. They're, they're after those things. And when they get common items, they're often disappointed. There's even terms in gaming to refer to these things. Players refer to common items as vendor trash, useless to them, something they're not interested in having. There's also the, op uh, the, the idea that um, some of these items are going to be more useful to players than others. And so you can lose in another way. If you get something that you want um, that's going to be helpful to you in future games, then you've won. If you don't get something that's going to be helpful, then you've lost. And players talk about these things very much as you talk about traditional forms of gambling. Um, you know, we, we have people talking about the number of times you'll get a legendary drop, the percentage of, of boxes that you'll open that will have a legendary drop. Um, you know, the number of, of cents per hour you can make to uh, toward a, a loot box. Um, so this is very much in the discourse of gambling as well. Now, the other way that we can think about losing is the fact that when we look at our sales data, about 93% of sales by players are made for less than that entry cost of purchasing a loot box of $2 to $2.50. And so what we see is that the majority of people are losing money. And in fact, when you look at the amount of money they're selling their items for, most of those 93% are selling their items for around one to two cents US. And so what we're seeing is that the majority of people are losing, losing almost all of their initial $2.50 stake. And just for reference, um, as you would be well aware, um, you know, 97% is the loss rate from, uh, you know, a, a roulette wheel. So we're, look, we're talking about losses around the same area that you see in, in traditional bona fide forms of gambling. Now, the other, other way you might be able to lose is through these duplicate items. And you'll remember that I directed your attention in that initial gift to the item that popped up and then was yielding a little coin. It looked a bit like this. Um, this particular uh, item is actually a duplicate item the player has received. And so they've actually received their, their item um, that they already own. It's not giving them any additional uh, item that can be used. And instead, what the game does is gives you a very small amount of virtual currency that isn't enough to buy a different item when, and isn't enough to buy a new loot box. Um, it's just a small sort of supplementary, oh, you didn't get anything useful prize. And uh, you can think about this very much like that dead parrot. It's not very useful to you. It doesn't do anything. Um, it's just kind of in the boxes. Okay. So at this point, I think we've highlighted the psychological, structural, and legal similarities of loot boxes to traditional form of gambling. And so the next question I think we need to address is, are these things harmful to players? And there's a few different ways that you might think about harm. The first one is, do people overspend on loot boxes? This is the data uh, from one of our papers. Uh, this is actually hot off the press, currently under review at the moment. It's an analysis of the spending patterns of gamers. And what we see is that um, on average, people don't spend a particularly large amount on loot boxes. And this is something that we see popping up every now and again where people talk about, well, on average, you know, people are only spending $5.70 US a month on loot boxes. Um, so this is loot box spend in the last month. Um, and that totals up to about 70 US dollars a year. Now, there are a couple of reasons why I think we need to be careful about that. The first one is this. This circle here um, as you move up the screen, you can see these additional dots on the screen. And those dots on the screen indicate 
an individual participant who has indicated they've spent more than that, uh, that $5.70 average. And what you see here is that you start to, to tail off, but there's this long tail of spending. Some people report spending you know, upwards of $100 a month. Some people report upwards of, of $250. Um, you, know, you occasionally get someone who's $500, and then you occasionally get someone saying that they've spent uh, $1,000 or more on loot boxes just in the last month alone. And so this suggests that, the, that much like traditional gambling, you see a, uh, a kind of long tail of harm that comes out of these things, where some people, a small proportion, maybe one to two percent, maybe up to about five percent, depending on the data set, um, are overspending and overspending quite a lot on these mechanisms. Now, the other thing that I just want to point out is that the context in which these data exist is important. Um, we need to remember that we know now that 40% of Kiwis and 56% of Americans have less than $1,000 in the bank. So when we're talking about less than $1,000 in the bank, 70 US dollars a year is not a trivial sum of money. Um, and we, we need to remember that when we're, we're talking about this issue. In fact, 15% of Kiwis, it was found last month, um, have no savings at all, zero dollars. And so if they've got no savings, then 70 US dollars a year is an important sum of money to be thinking about. Now, this then leads you to the question, well, okay, is it just people who are rich who are spending on this? Is it just people who've got more money than cents who are dumping sort of money into loot boxes? This is a, a, an analysis of spending data that was done um, by an income data that was done by my PhD student, Eamon Garrett, or one of my PhD students, Eamon Garrett, um, that's just been published in the last couple of months. And what we see is that there is a small effect of income, but it's not particularly pronounced. You do see that you know, people at the lowest income brackets and the highest income brackets are um, spending less and more um, you know, relatively. But in the middle income brackets, there's not much going on. Everyone's spending around the same amount. More importantly, though, these income brackets hide some really important, quite worrying trends. Within each of these categories, it's always problem gamblers and moderate risk gamblers who are the ones who are spending the most. So you can see that they are consistently across each of these income brackets, the, the highest kind of spenders, and they're the ones with the longest tails of spending because they're, they're going to have those people in them most likely that have those kind of you know, 200 $300, $500 a month spending patterns. So this is quite concerning. So this might lead you to a question then about what is the relationship between problem gambling symptoms and the potential for harm more broadly? And there is indeed a small to moderate relationship between spending on loot boxes and problem gambling symptoms, and it's pretty robust. This is a meta-analysis that was conducted by another one of my PhD students, Sean Garia, um, who undertook analysis on over 16,000 participants who had answered surveys on loot boxes and video games and their spending patterns with uh, problem gambling symptoms. And what we see is a small effect for the statisticians in the audience about 0.26, R, R equals 0.26. Um, so this is a correlation coefficient um, between problem gambling symptoms and spending on loot boxes. In here, it's important to note there are a couple of uh, Aotearoa samples. So um, this is both internationally and also domestically that we do see uh, this effect occurring. And in fact, in the, in the Aotearoa samples, we're seeing slightly higher effects than that average, um, which is slightly concerning to us. The other thing to note here is that Zendel, Meyer and Over down the bottom, my, my colleague um, David Zendel from the UK, um, who spoke at the think tank as well, um, has an adolescent sample and the effect size is larger among adolescents than it is among adults. Uh, so this is an indication that we probably need to be thinking a lot about um, the potential harms for underage users. Now, one thing to note for this and, and the next three slides is that this does not necessarily mean that engaging with loot boxes is causing problem gambling. All we know is that the two are associated, and I'll show you some data in a minute which suggests that it may actually be the case that this is a risk factor. So problem gambling symptoms are a risk factor for overspending rather than a consequence of engaging with these loot boxes. Now, there's also a small to moderate relationship to excessive gaming, so overuse of, of games. However, um, there's a few caveats I want to 
put here. So this is again from the same meta-analysis by Sean um, that I just showed you, but this is to excessive gaming um, symptoms. And again, it contains a couple of Aotearoa samples. However, um, it's really important to note that there's not a lot of studies, there's not a lot of data. This is not enough for us to be making firm judgments on whether there is an association here and we do need to be doing more work in this field. Um, nonetheless, the other thing, of course, again, we don't know that this is causing excessive gaming. It may well be people who are excessively gaming are being exposed to more loot boxes and therefore um, yeah, have more opportunities to purchase them. And finally, I want to show you some data that's currently under review. So this is hot off the press. Um, there is an, also an association between uh, severe psychological distress, by which I mean psychological distress that's severe enough that it would be indicative of potential depression, anxiety conditions, um, and loot box purchasing. Here, I'm going to show you the relative risk of being diagnosed as a, a person at risk of having anxiety and depression. Um, in our data and um, whether you've purchased loot boxes or not. And what you see is that the relative risk is about 1.85 times. You're about 1.85 times more likely to be at risk of uh, severe anxiety and depression when you have purchased loot boxes as compared to uh, when you do not. And this is not the same risk as we see for other forms of spending. So you do not see the same, you see a little bit of an elevated risk, but not anywhere near as much elevated risk when people are playing games, when people are buying downloadable content, when people are buying other in-game items. Um, this risk seems to stand alone for loot boxes as much higher than all the other uh, categories of spending. Again, this doesn't mean it's causing anxiety and depression. Um, it may well be a coping mechanism for anxiety and depression. So this leads us to the causal directionality. What is actually going on here, we do not know. Um, we still don't know whether engaging with loot boxes is causing this psychopathology or whether psychopathology is a risk factor for uh, engaging with loot boxes. However, we do are starting to get a little bit of an idea about this. We are currently running some experiments to understand this, and I can give you some preliminary data from one of those experiments. Again, um, something that's under review, so it's a bit of hot off the press for you. Um, we have a game designing company that we are working with who has produced us some really uh, top-notch quality games that look very much like the ones that you would see on uh, you know, your phone or, or um, computer. Um, so here, players are asked to engage with this game, um, match a number of, of items together um, on this screen, and while they're doing this, they're asked to engage with this uh, loot box uh, mechanism or not. So they might be asked to engage with a loot box mechanism like the one up top here, or they might be asked to engage with uh, a fixed reward mechanism where you can purchase things with your, your points and coins as you earn them. Um, and then what we do is we get them to engage with this for about you know, 20, 30 minutes, um, and after that, we ask them to do another risky task. In this case, we've asked them to do the balloon analog risk-taking task. So this is a task, as I'm sure many of you are aware of, um, where basically we ask people to pump up a virtual balloon uh, by pressing a, a key on the computer. And if uh, the balloon pops, then the participant is sad and doesn't get anything out of that at all. Um, or if the balloon um, manages, to, they stop it before it pops, then they will get uh, an amount of tokens on a future um, raffle that we're going to give them something from um, to enter into that raffle proportionate to the amount of times that they pump the balloon up. So the idea here is that the, the more risk they take, the more potential for reward, but actually also the more potential for failure because of course it's a, a risky task. Now, when we do this, um, we don't see anything happening with loot boxes. So uh, getting people to engage with loot boxes prior to undertaking this task uh, doesn't seem to alter the amount that they pump up a balloon or engage in the balloon analog risk-taking task. Um, and in fact, if anything, the amount they engage with is a little bit lower. They don't pump up the balloon quite as much um, as when people have been engaging in fixed uh, rewards or no reward conditions. For those of you who might be statisticians in the audience, the, the base factor for that's about nine. So it's about nine times more likely that there isn't an effect of loot boxes on risk taking uh, than there is. So although this is still unknown, whether or not loot boxes are causing problem gambling symptoms, um, 
our initial data suggests that problem gambling is probably not uh, being caused by engaging with loot boxes. Our initial data is more suggesting that problem gambling is a risk factor for overspending rather than uh, a consequence uh, of it. But even so, it, it's important to understand that I think this means a consumer protection framework is really appropriate in this circumstance because we have uh, a, a group of people who are vulnerable to overspending and we need to be making sure that we're minimising harm or the potential for harm of overspending for those people. So that brings us to the last question. What do we do about this? Um, and this is still a, a really big point that we are working on, something that we still don't know entirely what to do, but we can give you some initial ideas. The first is um, age restrictions. The most obvious thing that comes to mind is if, if these things are gambling, then perhaps we should restrict them and restrict access to minors. As I told you before, the, the evidence does suggest that the association between problem gambling and spending on loot boxes is about twice as strong for adolescents as it is for uh, adults. So there is some evidence to suggest that an age restriction strategy might be a logical starting point. Um, this might be most appropriate for the most clear cut cases of loot boxes, where loot boxes meet all the psychological and structural and legal similarities to traditional forms of gambling. Um, that might be where age restrictions are most appropriate if we intend to deploy them. However, we would caution against wider bans. Um, Belgium has done this. They have att attempted to ban all loot boxes and put a hefty fine on any games company that implements them. Um, there's a couple of reasons we would would caution against those. One is that they're potentially not likely to be particularly effective. Um, we're, we're in a global market here, which uh, is very difficult to regulate. And in fact, a, a recent um, study that's being done by um, one of my colleagues has, uh, has traveled to Belgium and uh, found that a, a large number of games are still containing loot boxes despite this ban. Uh, so it is very difficult to regulate it. It's very difficult to, to deal with this issue. Um, one of the big problems is we, we probably don't at the moment have the resources to be classifying these loot boxes and we probably need to think about resourcing our, uh, our classification agencies in different ways or at least more. Um, the, there are kind of different methods for classification. When a, a game is physically released in a box, it will be reviewed by someone on the ground um, in the country. And quite often when a game is released just in digital, it is uh, actually self-reported by the game's developer as to the features of the game. And so this can lead to lots of inaccuracies and difficulties with regard to that self-report rating system and, and relies on the goodwill of the developer to actually disclose the information to people. Uh, so that's one big problem. There are other big problems as well. Um, when you're talking about a globalised market where people are playing video games against one another in different countries, um, we do know that we could actually make the situation a little bit worse. If you take loot boxes out of one country but not another country, you could generate these multiplayer inequalities where players in the country that have had the bans feel like they're underpowered if those are um, rewards that are going to be functionally important to the players and, and making other players more powerful than them. Um, the other way that people get around this is through, unfortunately, you know, technological means make it very easy to get around it. Um, so with some simple kind of technological knowledge and a virtual private network, you can get around any of those loot box bans if that's your intention. So, you know, they're, they're not exactly going to be the most airtight solution anyway. And the last thing is we do need to think about censorship here. Um, we know that some games have actually been pulled from stores completely because of these bans. And as a result of that, um, the game itself has actually been essentially censored in the country. That's uh, something that we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about regulations. Sorry about that beeping. Um, okay, the next thing we might think about doing is limit setting. And um, this is something that comes from the traditional gambling literature. We're all fairly familiar with it, I'm imagining, um, where what we, we do is we ask people either to self-set limits um, ahead of, of playing games such as um, pokey machines, or we actually have a, a hard limit that no one can spend more than a certain amount. And there's some suggestion that this could be useful in the loot box field. What you're seeing on the screen at the moment is a graph of the spending behaviours um, at different spending categories along the bottom. 
And along this here, the white bars represent uh, the proportion of spenders who are moderate risk gamblers and the proportion of spenders who are problem gamblers. At the highest spending levels up at this more than $300 a month, um, despite the fact that this is only about 1% of the data, about 30%, uh, 33% of, of gamers at this spending level either are moderate risk or problem gamblers. And you can see it kind of, you know, across the spectrum, it starts to rise slowly. Um, this is the area of the, the graph I think is most interesting to us from a limit setting um, perspective. Here, it gives us some indication that as we hit about $50 a month, we're starting to see that proportion of problem gamblers and moderate risk gamers drastically rise in our population. And so this might give us an indication of where we might want to think about setting limits. Somewhere around that $50 range might be an appropriate starting point um, to think about. Now, the last um, kind of strategy uh, is, is kind of to just inform people about this issue. And um, I think can, there's a lot to be said for a consumer information approach, provided we can get one that's fit for purpose. This is something that's been done at the moment in um, both Europe and the US. And what they've done is to uh, disclose to people using these little uh, tiny uh, sort of statements at the bottom of their existing warning labels that these games include paid randomised items or these games include randomised items. Um, and by telling people about this, the hope is that they'll be able to make more informed decisions for themselves and their farming. However, we um, ran an analysis of this, in more, more specifically my uh, PhD student Eamon Garrett ran an analysis of this issue. And one of our first concerns was that we basically said to people, hey, read this warning label, tell us what you think it means. And unfortunately, only 75% of people said that these warning labels indicated that you could spend money. So um, this is a bit of a problem for us, obviously, at the, the first instance, um, we're already tripping at the first hurdle when one in four people is uh, saying, not, not understanding that includes paid items means you can pay for the items. That's a little bit of a concern to us. What's more of a concern to us is that fewer than 40%, fewer than two in five people um, understood this, that this meant that items were chance-based. So even though these warning labels specifically say they have random items in them, um, less than two in five people understood that that meant that those items were determined by chance. Uh, so obviously this means that the current comprehension of these warnings is pretty low and we probably need to be working to develop better warning systems for players. The other issue around warning labels is around post-game launch content. Um, one of the features of video games is that they are no longer like they were many years ago. Um, back in sort of the 90s, when you bought a game, you bought a game and you owned that game and it wouldn't change. It would just be the game that was launched. However, the advent of, you know, kind of being always connected to the internet means that we now have games that are patched and changed and altered as time goes along. And this can cause some rather large issues. One of them being that uh, games can change whether they have loot boxes in them um, from the time they're launched to later in, in their development cycles. Um, now, this is something that actually happened while we were writing up our initial uh, analysis of uh, loot box features. We uh, wrote up the, the paper and there was 50% of games had loot boxes in them. Um, by the time we got our reviews back, it was 55% had loot boxes that met all five criteria for gambling in them. And then by the time our second round of reviews came back, it had dropped down to 45%. And what was happening is that games companies were getting savvy to the conversation that was going on at the time around whether or not these things approximated gambling. And they were tweaking the features of loot boxes very slightly, um, changing you know, kind of aspects of, of those loot box features, which then changed whether or not they were being classified under our psychological criteria as a form of gambling. This is a real big problem because it means that um, 
mo in most instances, we only classify games when they're released and they're usually never reclassified, which means that if they get a warning label at the beginning that says there's no loot boxes in them and later loot boxes are placed in them, uh, that never shows up on the warning labels. And so parents uh, and consumers can't make decisions for themselves if they don't know these items are actually in there. Um, so because implementation of post-launch loot boxes does occasionally uh, occur, we need to be very, very cognizant um, that if we're going to take a warning label approach, we need to be thinking about it as a living document, a living strategy that will change over time as games change as well. Now, the last thing we can do, and I think this is, is probably our best defense at the moment, is consumer awareness campaigns. Um, Basically, because uh, of, of all the issues I've talked about, teaching consumers about what loot boxes are and providing them with a good understanding of what they look like and what they can and can't do is going to be the best defence for people to be able to make the best decisions for themselves and their farming. And this is something we're starting to do quite well in Aotearoa. Um, so you can see on the screen here a couple of things that have been created, a couple of really great resources have been created by the Problem Gambling Foundation and the uh, Office of, of Film and Literature Classification, which is now called uh, the Classification Office. Um, and so we have on the left uh, our kind of guide for parents and whanau, um, which you can see, uh, by the way, you can go to this web link at the bottom to, to have a look at these, um, which will give a really good understanding of the core features of loot boxes to start that conversation uh, with your children uh, about, you know, what's in the games, what's going on, what's the monetization system. And they've got a great little uh, video as well, which will tell you a little bit about loot boxes in video games and, and how they work in a very succinct manner. Um, this is probably a really good strategy to be pursuing at the moment. And one of the reasons is that loot boxes are a bit chameleonic. They tend to look like different things. The terms that are used to describe them vary. Um, some people will call them loot boxes. Some people will call them loot crates. Diablo Immortal calls, calls them rifts. Um, they change in the way that we talk about them. They change in the way that um, you know, people are using terminology and they change in how they look and act. Sometimes they'll look like the slot machine. Sometimes they'll be a lot more subtle like that initial loot box that I showed you opening, which perhaps doesn't look as, as much like a traditional form of gambling as a slot machine does. And so the best thing that we can do is teach people about loot boxes and have them understand uh, the features of them, have the conversations with their, their whanau um, and, uh, and try and understand um, what's going on in these games so they can make their, the best decisions that are possible. Okay, um, so just briefly to sum up before I'll invite any questions. Um, what I've talked about today is, is really that loot boxes are structurally, psychologically and legally uh, very similar to traditional bona fide forms of gambling. There is, uh, according to our meta-analyses, a robust association between spending and problem gambling symptoms, including in Aotearoa. Um, it's probably not the case, I don't think at this point, that spending is causing problem gambling. I think more likely um, that spending is being caused by problem gambling symptoms. So it's a vulnerability and a vulnerable consumer that we need to be worried about here. Um, the other issue here is that, you know, we need to be protecting people with problem gambling symptoms. We also need to be thinking more broadly about other things like excessive gamers and people who have psychopathology of depression and anxiety, because those things seem to all be associated with loot box purchasing and overspending. The current consumer advice and warning labels are probably inadequate. We need to be doing a little bit more on those fronts. Um, and we really need to be thinking about education and uh, consumer protection campaigns. And this is something that we talked about at the think tank as well. I think, um, you know, teaching our, our children in schools about um, digital literacy and digital safety is going to be a really important strategy for safeguarding uh, against, um, you know, kind of these kind of predatory um, monetization mechanisms. So Kiora, thank you very much for listening. And uh, I'd love to take any questions that you might have. Um, at the bottom, there's my email address and I'm very happy to receive any emails that people might have as well. Thank wow, thank you very much, Aaron, for that uh, great presentation. We've got uh, about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, do we have a roaming mic, please? Does anyone have any questions? Oh, the question in the front here to, for Bridget, from Bridget. 
Sorry, just down in the front here. I think he's going to turn it on, Bridget. Hello. Kia ora, Aaron. Um, it's Bridget Thornley from PGF Services. Um, I was wondering if the games without loot, loot boxes are less exciting <laughs> in the sense of, like a lot of gambling products, if you take away the, the chance features, then they become less exciting. So if the ones with loot boxes are sort of more attractive and to gamers. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how well I can answer that question except to say that I don't think that is the case. Um, and, and this is one of the things that I think um, is very heartening to me is that if you talk to gamers, um, you will find that a large swath of them really don't like loot boxes. They don't like loot boxes in their games. They don't want loot boxes in their games. Um, they, they talk about them, uh, lots of them talk about them as gambling already, um, and, and they really don't find a lot of added value from them. Uh, so I don't know that many, many gamers uh, would be concerned if loot boxes were removed from games, um, except for all those kind of you know, issues of, of equity across um, locations or, or games being banned that we talked about before, um, I don't think they'd be too concerned um, because in most cases, opening the loot boxes isn't the core thing you're trying to do in a game. You're trying to play the game itself. And so, you know, players that want to play a soccer game or a, a basketball game probably just want to play their basketball game rather than having to also open these loot boxes that uh, are kind of gambling like. That's great. Paula? Oh, kia ora, Aaron. Um, Paula Snowden again. At, at the think tank on Tuesday, one of the participants commented on the fact this is on the theme of consumer education. So we are investing here in teaching children, including in our low socioeconomic communities, to, to learn how to write games, participate in the digital economy, develop things. And the speaker then, Edmund, it was, said, should we be teaching them how to make games safe rather than just make games to make money? Any thoughts on how we could build that into consumer education? Um, I think that's a brilliant point. Um, and not necessarily one that I'd limit to games, to be honest. Uh, I, I think one of the things that we need to be doing, and I think probably one of the things we do better in Aotearoa than in, in some other places around the world, is to teach not just uh, you know, the, the structural issues and, and the, the monetary issues, but to teach the ethical um, practices issues. And I think that's something we should be focusing on is, is ethical practice in, in all sorts of things. One of the, the points that I think gets overlooked by games companies, um, which I think is really short-sighted, is that I don't think that, you know, gamers don't like these items, as I just said. They don't want to be engaging with them. And... <sighs> Really, you know, if you're generating money off of a small number of people who are problem gamblers uh, or, or have those kind of issues, that's not really a viable way to generate money. It's going to cause major problems for those people. Um, and so I don't think it's really a, a question of whether we should be generating money or, or being ethical. I think it's about sustainable development, ensuring that um, gamers are subjected to a sustainable monetization system that means that games can be made and, and can be monetized in a way that means that you know, people can make money off them, um, but doesn't exploit vulnerable consumers. That's good. Any more questions? Oh, out there. Okay, lucky I wore my running shoes. Um, my question was around whether you've looked into the relationship between rewards-based um, loot boxes and, uh, I guess, purchased loot boxes. So, 
I know from experience that you know there's games where you can perform to a certain level, receive these loot boxes as as a reward, and whether there's any relationship between that and then purchasing the loot boxes afterwards. Um, I don't think we specifically have to date looked at that. That is something that um, we are doing some work on. Uh, so may, maybe ask me back at some point and I'll um, be able to present that, those data when we have them. What I can say is that I had a master's student uh, who did a project on this issue last year or, or the year before, um, looking at the relationship between watching loot box opening videos and um, the association that that has to future purchasing. And we did find that people who watched loot box opening videos um, online were more likely to then go and buy loot boxes subsequently. Um, you know, in terms of, of whether they would produce, uh, you know, these rewards ones that you are given would produce uh, people going out and purchasing them. It's unclear. It's an, uh, clearly an empirical question that we need to answer, uh, but there's good reason to think they probably would. Um, you know, that, that kind of free taste of this is what you, know, you could be getting out of a loot box um, is, is the kind of thing that may well lead to future engagement. So it's something that I am concerned about um, and we are looking into, but I can't give you hard data on that at the moment. No more questions? Okay. Okay, we've got no more questions, Aaron. Uh, we do have uh, sessions this afternoon on gaming and gambling. I think it's in room WG. WG126. So we would have the more talent on this. Uh, later on this afternoon, but uh, Aaron, on behalf of uh, IGC and our whānau here, we'd just like to thank you. Uh, thank you for your great presentation, and I, I always used to think that gaming was a young people's activity, but no, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> I have 45-year-olds uh, gaming, quite, um, quite uh, you know, uh, engrossed in it. So uh, this is a really interesting um, and topical top topic for us as we're trying to navigate not only the online space for gambling but also uh, the, the ever-evolving space of online gaming. And it, as, as you say, it's, it's continuously changing. The, the mechanisms are continually being, being upgraded. And, you know, we, we said in, during Think Tank, we we come up with a solution or some, some mechanisms to make changes and frameworks, and the industry are five steps ahead of us already. You know, they see us do something and they go, right, let's, let's combat that, mitigate that, and make something else. And so we're kind of like, always kind of like trying to catch up. So um, thank you very much, Aaron, for a great presentation, and uh, please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Aaron Drummond. <laughs>